What I would like to do tonight is to give you a kind of an overview of general semantics, some of which I've covered in the introductory course, some of which I lectured on last night, some of which I will be covering in the advanced course. But I realize that, again, we have a heterogeneous group, some people who have taken the introductory course, some who have not. And I understand that one of the teachers of general semantics is here with some of his students, and I'm very, very happy to see this because in Chicago we had some difficulty getting teachers, professors interested in coming into the group and participating, and this is very, very important. I'm very happy that so many of you are here tonight, and especially that you are starting in with a special interest group. So what I have done is to outline general semantics, some of the ideas. I'm not going to give my jokes and illustrations that I do in my classes, because the, then the speech would be about five times as long as it will be. And this may appear to be a little bit of an academic presentation, but I do want to uh, consider with you some of the important ideas of Alfred Korzybski, of general semantics, and generally what general semantics is all about. Alfred Korzybski was the or father of general semantics. He basically coined the term in a book called Science and Sanity. But before that, he wrote a book called um, Manhood of Humanity, in which he postulated the difference between man and animal. First of all, he said there are three different classes of life. Number one, there is plant life. And what is the important characteristic of plant life? The important characteristic of plant life is the fact that they are chemistry binding. Through the photosynthesis, they are able to sustain life. He was asking for an operational definition because we define man as a rational animal. And Korzybski used to say, oh yeah, where the hell is it? We used to, we define man in terms of many metaphysical concepts. But we want an operational definition of man. And this is what he was looking for. So plants are chemistry binding. They manufacture their energy through solar energy, etc. They sustain life. They are one-dimensional chemistry binding. Then he asked the questions, how about animals? What do animals do? Notice we want operational, empirical distinctions, definitions, answers, not verbal. What do animals do that plants do not do? They certainly are chemistry binding, but they are also space binders. And this was his definition of animals. So they are two-dimensional, whereas plants were one-dimensional. They are two-dimensionals. They move around in space. And how about man? You and I are taught in high school that man is an animal. And Korzybski often stated that we can behave like animals and rationalize our animalistic behavior. But what does man do that animals do not do? Man can take from the past, summarize, digest, and pass on to future generations the labors of the past and the present. And why is man a time binder? Because man has the unique characteristic of being a symbolic being, a symbol-using being. And he has a language. Now, it is true that, la that language is also a characteristic to a degree of animal behavior, but as you know, the orders of abstraction with animals stop somewhere. Korzybski said usually after two orders of abstraction, as we will see on the structural differential here. And I will refer to the structural differential, because this was a visual diagram that Korzybski was forced into creating when he lectured in front of John Watson and other scholars in New York. This is a structural differential showing the different orders of abstraction non-verbally and verbally. And here we have Fido, or an animalistic level, that I will talk about. So man, because he has the kind of language that he does, 
he is able to progress in a geometric ratio or in an exponential function. Whereas animals, for example, if there's any progress at all, it is little or none. For example, birds build bird nests the same way they did hundreds, thousands of years ago. Beavers build beaver dams the same way they did hundreds, thousands of years ago. There is no progression, especially in a geometric ratio. And now we have civilization, tremendous technological advances. We have men flying to the moon. These are all due to the labors of thousands and thousands of giants, mental giants, important scientists, physicists, medical doctors, medical physicists, etc. And notice how many of these people, they are no longer medical doctors. They are no longer physicists, but we are bringing these together. This is what Korzybski talked about as elementalistic implications. Elementalism is when you can separate things verbally, or when we do separate them verbally, but you cannot separate them empirically, such as mind and body, space and time, chemistry and physics. We now know that these kinds of disjointed studies actually are interrelated. And this was one of the important things that Korzybski talked about. He said, we need to overcome these elementalistic ways of thinking, separating verbally that which cannot be separated empirically. And I will talk more about that because the, the hyphen that Korzybski was talking about is one of the working devices for intelligently structuring the world of reality. See, in general semantics, we are concerned about making our language fit the structure of the world of reality. And Korzybski said the old Aristotelian way of thinking, talking, and behaving is not adequate today. It may have been adequate 2,000 years ago. So language is a tremendously important tool, not only for communicating, but we actually think in terms of the structure of the language we use, the structure of the language that we have inherited. And this is why I say, while semantics is a limited study, semantics being the study of the meaning of words or the history of meaning changes. General semantics is a combination of anthropology, neurology, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, physics, philosophy, philosophy of science, ad infinitum. You cannot separate these particular disciplines. And we literally think and perceive the world of reality in terms of the structure of the language that we use. Now, this was a very important concept, and there were predecessors of Korzybski, but no one really emphasized language as an important environment until Korzybski did in Science and Sanity. And we feel that this is one of the most important contributions of Alfred Korzybski, emphasizing language as an important environment, indicating what we think, how we think, how we perceive, how we behave, etc., and now more research in the behavioral sciences and psychiatry in other areas indicates that Korzybski certainly was right. So man is a time-binding class of life. Man is not an animal because man has the unique characteristic of having the kind of language he has. He can take from the past, summarize, and pass on to future generations the labors of the past and the present. Universities are a good example of man's time-binding functions. Libraries are a good example of man's time-binding characteristic. And therefore, man is not an animal, but we can behave like animals. And this is what we are concerned with, because Korzybski asked the question, why do we have wars? Why do we have fights? Why do we have arguments? And as I mentioned in the seminar last night, and of course I will re repeat some of this because many of you were not here, Korzybski asked, where do we find thinking at its best? And he answered his own question in the sciences. What do the scientists do? They analyze the structure of the world of reality first, and then they make their language, their thinking, their behavior fit the structure of the world of reality. Now notice I use the word structure. And I will only hint at it tonight, but I will cover it more fully 
uh, in the advanced seminar, those of you who are taking the advanced seminar. All right, so the scientist analyzes the structure of the world of reality, the nonverbal facts. Then he makes his thinking, his language, his formulas fit the structure of the world of reality. This is thinking at its best. This is why scientists, this is why engineers are able to build bridges, buildings that will stay for thousands and thousands of years. They make their thinking fit the facts. Then he also asked another question, where do we find thinking at its worst? And what do they do? Why are there so many fights, arguments, disagreements, etc., and in what area? And Korzybski's answer, the opposite of scientific behavior or sanity is insane behavior or insanity. In fact, their thinking is so bad that we've got to lock them up. Now, what do the insane do? They do just the opposite of what the scientists would do. They try to make the world of reality fit what is up here. They reverse the process. All right, now Korzybski asks the further question, how about you and me? We're certainly not very sane because we have so many wars and fights and arguments and disagreements. We have many misevaluations. We're not insane. They haven't caught up with us yet. <laughs> Korzybski used a term that I think is a very, very fine term to define the vast continuum between sanity and insanity. Korzybski said that you and I are unsane. We are unsane. And he went further than this. He said, you and I have unsane semantic reactions. Now, he did not use the word thinking because, again, the word thinking has the old elementalistic Aristotelian implications. What do I mean by this? The old implications, Aristotelian-wise, that you can separate, again, thinking, the thought processes, from biological functions, neurological reactions, etc., that you can separate the mind from the body. This is what we mean by elementalism again. So Alfred Korzybski used a non-elementalistic term. A non-elementalistic term is a term that does not separate verbally that which cannot be separated empirically. And his non-elementalistic term was semantic reaction. By this he means that we have meanings inside of our nervous systems. And this is the difference between semantics and general semantics. Semantics in the more limited study starts with the assumption that meanings are in words. General semantics starts with the assumption that meanings are in people. They are in our skins. As Charles Sanders Pierce, the famous pragmatic philosopher, said, you do not get meaning, you respond with meaning. So whenever you see the word semantic, you can substitute the word meaning. And obviously, by the word reactions, we can th think in terms of neurological responses. So you must think of the organism as a whole, and that isn't enough. Organism as a whole in an environment. Now, this is what Korzybski, long before we talked about ecology as a popular term, this is what we mean by ecological thinking. If you're going to study man, you must study man in an environment. And if you forget about studying man in an environment, you are being elementalistic. You are splitting him off from his environment, which obviously you cannot do empirically. We all live in, in an environment, and as you well know, we can generalize about men, about women, about children, about hippies, about everyone. But you put them in a different environment, and I think you will agree with me, that they behave differently in different environments. So too often we say that a person is such and such. Put them in a different environment and you find out that they aren't <laughs> such and such. So we have to think in terms of ecological thinking. We must at all times try to analyze people in an environment. So this is why Korzybski used 
the words unsane semantic reactions. And so people wrongly assume that general semantics is concerned with communication, with communication only. We are concerned with all kinds of thinking and behaving when you're on the job, when you are driving your automobiles. This is why in 1962 I gave the early morning lecture series to the National Safety Congress where I showed how the barriers to effective communication are exactly the same as the causes of accidents. The causes of accidents are 90% human error, human misevaluations. Most of our problems are due to human misevaluations. And this is what Alfred Korzybski was concerned with. So remember, semantics, the more limited study, deals with the meaning of words. In general semantics, we are concerned with semantic reactions. How you and I react to other people's verbalizations. We are also concerned with how we react to our own assumptions, attitudes, verbalizations. Because the most important kind of communicating or talking that you and I do is the kind of talking that we do to ourselves about ourselves, even when you don't, even, you don't open your mouth, or especially when you don't open your mouth. And this is why Korzybski said many of us are intentionally or verbally oriented. And what he tried to do in general semantics is to truly make individuals factually or extensionally oriented. In fact, what they try to do in a training session is to have you stop talking not only overtly, but covertly. How can you stop talking? How can you truly become extensional? And Charlotte Chouchart, one of Korzybski's early assistants, has had for many years at the Institute of General Semantics training sessions in extensionalization. And this is why I constantly say there's a big difference between learning something intellectually or theori theoretically and learning something extensionally or neurologically. You haven't learned until you behave in terms of general semantics. And one of the important things, I think, for our San Diego chapter, the International Society of General Semantics, is to look for better and better ways of training people in how to become extensional. Dr. Lee and I were interested in this important question at Northwestern University. And Dr. Lee used to say, how can we train a person, an executive, for example, to be extensionally or factually oriented in exactly the same way that a football coach trains his players, that a golf pro trains golfers? How can you and I, as teachers, get off of the verbal level and set up training situations for our students to try to perform in? Now, I give many of you the quizzes, as you know, but my quizzes are still verbal. How can you and I devise nonverbal experiential tests, things to do to test people to see how intentionally or extensionally oriented they are? Now, my speech tonight basically will be defining what do we mean by an intentional orientation, what do we mean by an extensional orientation. More specifically, an intentional orientation is a verbal orientation. Here we have a nonverbal fact or facts. And here we have a label. And too many of us react to the nonverbal facts or to the world around us via or in terms of the label. Put a label on a person and, brother, you've got them to the verbally oriented person. That's the intentional orientation. People who respond to words, people who respond to people via or in terms of labels. Whereas the factually oriented, the extensionally oriented person will react to nonverbal people, situations, and things in terms of the person, the situation, or the thing. He will not be controlled by the label. And unfortunately, our educational systems are confusing words with things. One of the important things that Korzybski kept talking about is the word is not the thing. Those of you who took my seminars, remember I had you pinch your finger and tell me what you felt. And we went through the training session that you cannot tell me what you felt. Whatever you tell me you felt, this is not what you felt. These are words that describe what you felt. 
but they are not on the same order of abstraction. And this is why Korzybski built and drew this structural differential. Now, here at the top is what we call the submicroscopic level of electrons, protons, neutrons. Underneath all matter is a mad dance. And this is why we say this is the event level or the process level. Things are constantly changing. Remember that word change, because this is very, very important in general semantics. What we are trying to do is to make our thinking and our behaving fit the structure of the world of reality. And if we know that the A structure of the world of reality is change, we must change our ways of thinking. But as, as we will see, too many people have static, non-changing orientations in a changing world. People who have hates, dislikes, prejudices, envy, jealousy toward others for 5, 10, 20 years or longer. Or worse than that, they have the same static, non-changing orientations about themselves. And this, I think, is even a worse kind of an evaluation, a mis-evaluation to have. It's bad enough to have a static, non-changing orientation toward others, but we must learn to re-evaluate ourselves. And Korzybski has some extensional techniques, some extensional devices with which to accomplish this. All right, so this is the submicroscopic level. The lines coming down to the macroscopic level, macro meaning large, this is what we abstract or select from the submicroscopic level. Now, the macroscopic level is what we see, observe, feel, etc. The chair you see, the table you see, the person you see. This is the macroscopic level. All right, now notice these strings hanging away. This indicates what we leave out. Can we ever know all about anything? And the answer, of course, is no, as far as we know. So Korzybski had these strings hanging out, which means these are the things that we miss. This is what our nervous system misses. We cannot abstract or select everything. So the guy who thinks he knows it all, the guy who is afflicted with allness, A-L-L-N-E-S-S, -S, the assumption that we know it all, this, of course, scientifically is a misevaluation. Because neurologically, because of all of the variables involved, neurologically, we cannot know all about anything. We cannot abstract everything in any situation. So Korzybski drew a diagram to illustrate how the nervous system works and in terms of the structure of the orders of abstraction. Then we can make a statement. For example, we can make a statement that all of you are in this room now listening to a lecture. I am giving a lecture. This is a descriptive statement. This is a statement of fact. Now notice, a statement of fact is not on the same order of abstraction as nonverbal facts. This is a nonverbal fact. This is a nonverbal fact. This is on the nonverbal level. And here we draw a line through separating the nonverbal world of reality from the verbal world of reality. All right, I have made a statement of fact. Now we can make an inference. We can say, for example, that our meeting tonight, we will take in $3,800. I think you will agree that's an inference. <laughs> that goes beyond the facts. All right? That is an inferential statement. That is on a different order of abstraction. Now, you or someone else can say that I said that we would take in $3,800 tonight. That is a statement about my statement. And notice how man, because he has language, can make statements about statements about statements indefinitely going further and further away from the nonverbal world of reality. Now, one of the definitions of the circularity of knowledge that Korzybski has talked about, and Bertrand Russell, although there are several different definitions, but let me just give you the one here, is that ultimately, you see, we can read back into the submicroscopic level. This is what we mean by theoretical physics, 
where you read back and the, the inferences of the highest level, you make certain assumptions of what's going on in the submicroscopic level of electrons, protons, neutrons. But notice the important thing. A statement of fact is not on the same order of abstraction as an inferential statement. All right? This indicates, again, that you will not jump to conclusions if you know the difference between the two. Also, a statement of fact or a word is not on the same order of abstraction as the macroscopic level. That means you will not identify, and I will talk about identification. You will not act as if the word were the thing. Now, too many of us react to people, situations, and things via or in terms of a label. And only man can truly keep his orders of abstraction separate. Animals don't know the difference between facts and inferences. This is why Korzybski did not have these strings going from the submicroscopic level down to Fido's level of the macroscopic level, his factual nonverbal level. As far as we know, animals, Fido, they know nothing about the submicroscopic level. So keep this in mind, that these are all different orders of abstraction, and this will be very important in terms of understanding general semantics. So this was enunciated in Korzybski's book, Science and Sanity. His time-binding theory was in his first book, Manhood of Humanity. Alfred Korzybski at first did not call his new system general semantics. He called his system the science and art of human engineering. And only when he found out that he was in the area of semantics, when he found out that he was in the area of meanings, he went through and throughout the whole book, almost the night before it was published, he substituted the words general semantics where the science and art of engineering had been. And so he called it general semantics, which was a non-Aristotelian orientation of man. Well, what do we mean by non-Aristotelian? Basically, he is contradicting to a degree Aristotle's laws of thought, and I will enunciate three of them. Two of them are important. His laws of thought, Aristotle's laws of thought, which is called the law of identity. A is A. And what Korzybski primarily was critical of was not so much the laws of thought as laws of thought. But in general semantics, we are concerned with orientations. By the word orientations, we mean ways of behaving. And as a limited law of thought, some of these in a limited sense are okay, but not as a way of behaving. By the law of identity, when we say A is A, convict is convict, negro is negro, ice cream is ice cream, oh yeah, leave some ice cream out in the sun for a minute, and it ain't the same. So when we think and behave only in terms of the first law of thought, A is A, Redhead is redhead. The implication, they're all the same. This doesn't show the differences, and this also leaves out ecological thinking or the relatedness. Another one which is a little more technical, the law of contradiction. A is not not A, or cannot be and not be. For example, if all things are process and changing, and all things are related... Any one thing may conceivably be A to one set of circumstances and not A to another. Thus, something may be both A and not A. Now, let's tie this up basically with the third one, which is related to it, the law of the excluded middle, and I will be talking about the two-valued orientation, which this gets into. A is either B or not B. This law asserts that one thing is or is not something with nothing in between. All right? The either-or way of thinking. Basically, this is what this deals with. The either-or way of thinking. And I'm not going to go into tonight the difference between contradictory statements and contraries or opposites. Tonight, I'm only going to be talking about contraries or opposites but in the advanced seminar, I'll be talking about the difference be between contradictory statements 
And Aristotle himself was the first one to point out the difference between contradictory statements and contraries or opposites. A contradictory statement, you are legitimate in using the either-or way of thinking. For example, you either came to this lecture tonight or you did not. Right? There's no middle ground. This is a contradictory statement. But a contrary statement is a statement at the opposite ends of a scale. Dumb, intelligent, good, bad. Too many of us use the either-or way of thinking, assuming they are contradictories, assuming that they both cannot exist simultaneously. But the important thing relative, notice it's an extension of the law of thought again, we say, for example, and here's one of the reasons why this is dangerous, and I will talk further about the either-or way of thinking. You and I may have a difference of opinion, let's say, right here in the center. And because of the allness language that we use, for example, a husband and wife are having some kind of a disagreement, and the wife will say, well, you always leave the toothpaste off of the... Yeah, but you always want to, when we go out, you want to visit your relatives. Yeah, but you do such and such. And with this either-or way of thinking, the assumption again, you are either for me or you are against me. This is an either-or way of thinking. I may be a moderate. And when we think in terms of the either-or, then we do not allow a third, fourth, or fifth alternative. And what is the answer to this? We must think in terms of degrees or graded variations. People aren't just tall or short. They're 5'1", 5'2", 5'3", 5'4". But as long as we only use our English language, which has no words or very few except the mathematical language, this is why mathematics is our most perfect language. But if I were to ask you to give me, which I do in the advanced class, by the way, to give me a word that stands for right in the middle, neither to the left nor to the right, Give me a word that stands right in the middle of the continuum, dumb, intelligent, good, bad, hot, cold. You'll find out that it is pretty difficult because most of our words in the English language are one extreme or the other. And no wonder we have polarity today because of the either-or way of thinking. And that will be one of the intentional orientations that I will be talking about. Now, Korzybski called his system a non-Aristotelian way of thinking. And many of the people wrongly assumed that Aristotle was a villain according to Alfred Korzybski. And this is not true. Korzybski dedicated his book, Science and Sanity, to many scholars, first of whom was Aristotle. Aristotle undoubtedly was the greatest intellect in the history of man, he probably wrote more, and most of what he wrote was lost through time. He was a brilliant man. He made brilliant observations, but his observations obviously were limited in terms of his time. So Korzybski said, just as we can have Euclidean geometry in a narrow sense, we also, with Lobachevsky and Riemann and other mathematicians who have extended Euclidean geometry, we have non-Euclidean geometries. They are an extension of Euclid's geometry. Here we have Newtonian physics, which is okay up to a certain point. But then Einstein added further theories, and we have non-Newtonian or Einsteinian physics. And Korzybski said relative to man. Here we have Aristotelian assumptions, which are limited, which are inadequate today. And so Korzybski added further, broader assumptions or orientations, which he called non-Aristotelian orientations. And this basically is what we are concerned with and what we will be talking about. Now, I said that language was a very important word to the general semanticist. And Korzybski, in defining the use of language, used what he called a map territory relationship. 
a map territory relationship. Korzybski said that just as a map is related to the nonverbal world of reality, language is also related to the nonverbal world of reality and works exactly the same way in the following manner. Number one, he said, the map is not the territory. The map that you and I use in driving our automobiles is not the nonverbal territory, right? Also, as an analogy, he said, the word is not the thing. And this is one of the things that we general semanticists constantly talk about. The word is not the thing. Do not identify the verbal level as if it were the nonverbal level. Do not react to words and verbal associations as if they were the nonverbal thing. So that is one similarity between a map territory relationship and a language territory relationship. Secondly, Korzybski said, the map does not cover all of the territory. And this is also true of language. No matter how much we describe a particular nonverbal event, our language does not exhaust everything that we observe. In other words, you cannot say all about anything. Therefore, we must have a non-allness orientation and realize the limitations of our language. He said another characteristic of a map, as well as language, is what he called self-reflexiveness. For example, here we have a map. And then you can have a map of a map. And you can have a map of that map and a map of that map, and we can go on indefinitely, having maps of maps of maps indefinitely. This is also true of language. You can have words about the nonverbal world of reality. Then you can have a word or a statement about that statement. You can have a statement about that statement. You can have a statement about that statement indefinitely. So this is another similarity between language and a map, the self-reflexiveness. Then there is another relationship, correlation. Korzybski said, to be accurate, a map must represent the structure of the world of reality. Now, remember I said that the word structure was very important. And how do we define the word structure? You define the word structure in terms of order and relations and this is a very important word in the philosophy in the philosophy of science one example that Korzybski used was in terms of a map of the United States here we have Los Angeles here we have Chicago and here we have New York now looking at the flat surface we would say the order here we have Chicago in between Los Angeles and New York or this is also a relationship Chicago is in between New York and Los Angeles. This indicates structure. All right? This map fits the structure of the world of reality. Now, if I were to have a map, and let's say I put Chicago over here and Los Angeles here, and here we have New the map does not fit the territory, right? And so we would have a lot of difficulty with our particular map if we wanted to follow it, if we wanted to get to New York, Chicago, or what have you. In exactly the same way, sometimes our language does not fit the structure of the world of reality. And therefore, we have a low degree of predictability or probability, which is the modern scientific definition of truth. So if our language, our talking, our behaving is going to have a high degree of probability, or truth value, or predictability, it must be in correspondence with the nonverbal world of reality. It must fit the facts. All right? So we were concerned, therefore, with language structure as an important part of the environment. Language is an important part of our environment. And what are some of the words that get us into difficulty? 
some of the words that have false implications. And Bertrand Russell recognized this quite a few years ago. And Alfred North Whitehead. It's the little word is. The little word is implies a false to fact relationship. Now, there are at least four different uses of the little word is. Is as an auxiliary verb. When we say, he is running, they are doing such and such. This is an auxiliary verb. We can use a second uh, use of the word is, is of existence, or the existence is. Washington, D.C. is in the United States. You are in this room now. But the two kinds of is's that we have difficulty with, said Korzybski, is the is of identity and the is of predication. And I think that Korzybski was a genius in talking about this. What do we mean by the is of identity? When you say, John Jones is a Negro. Bill Johnson is a doctor. Notice what we are doing here. You are identifying, and remember the word identify. This will be vertical identification. I will talk about two important different kinds of identification. You are identifying an individual person with a group or a class label or a class name. John Jones is a Negro, is a communist, is a Democrat, is a anything. And depending upon your attitude toward the high order abstraction, it's the easiest thing in the world for you and for me to react toward all Negroes, doctors, lawyers, psychiatrists, as if they're all the same. In other words, here again, our language structure does our thinking for us. And it's the easiest thing in the world to go through life not observing people, not seeing differences. And this is tremendously important. This is Korzybski's theory of non-identity. Please turn the cassette over for the start of Side B at this point. He said that there are no two things in the world of reality identical to each other. This is the principle of non-identity. But what creates identity? Our minds. If you observe the structure of the world of reality, no identical twins are identical. No grains of sand, of salt, are identical. And by identity, he means identical in all respects. And if you get too technical, of course, two things are not identical because obviously they are, on different, they are in different environments. And we are always related to a particular environment. So non-identity is very important in the system of general semantics because our language tends to imply similarities only especially our high-order abstractions. Words such as Negro, Catholic, teacher, disc jockey, model, actress, any word you want. And if I were to ask you, do these words point out the differences to be found in the world of reality? I think you will agree that they do not. Notice how the structure of our language, our language does our thinking for us in a false-to-fact way. And what Korzybski wanted was literally to change the structure of language, as we will see. And he had some novel and some most important ways of doing that. 
So this is the is of identity, how it identifies different orders of abstraction as if they were the same. The is of predication is where we predicate qualities into the world of reality that are really in us. When we say, for example, Jane is lazy, we predicate a quality in us into someone else. The pie is sweet. All right, have 20 people taste the pie. Maybe 15 people will say that it is sweet. Five people will say it is sour. Where is the sweetness? Really? Now that's a meaningless question if you say really. Because the is of predication again fails to include the human observer. This implies what we may call an objective philosophy that the world of reality is out there. The real world of reality is out there. The subjective philosophy would say the real world of reality is in my mind or in me. But Einstein says, uh-uh, we need at least three variables. We need something out there. We need an observer and from a point of view. So this indicates a relative position. And in order to overcome this is of predication, the tendency of you and of me to make evaluations and pr predicate or project into the world of reality our own assumptions, biases, likes, dislikes, as if they really were the world of reality, you and I must add two words. To me. Or I think. To me. She is smart, dumb, lazy, good, bad, or what have you. But notice, until or unless you include the words to me, the structure of your language does not indicate the relatedness. And this is due to this little word is, the is of predication. All right, now we don't have much difficulty, as I have said, with the auxiliary verb or the is of existence. But we do have difficulty with the is of identity and the is of predication. Now, these two cover up the relationship between the observer and the observed, both the is of identity and the is of predication. So Con Korzybski was concerned with the basic misevaluations. And what are the basic misevaluations that lead toward what he called an intentional orientation? Now, the intentional orientation are all of these misevaluations involved. Now, some people were critical of Alfred Korzybski for using a new kind of a word, intentional, with an S, instead of saying, well, the scientific method, but he's using a new word for a new concept. The intentional orientation is basically a a verbal orientation, whereas an extensional orientation, again with an S, an extensional orientation is a factual, nonverbal orientation. How do you and I achieve an extensional or a factual orientation? By being conscious of certain things. Number one, our language or our semantic environment, newspapers, radio, television, are constantly creating pictures inside of our heads and meanings inside of our nervous systems. Now this is our language or our semantic environment. The pictures inside of our heads, the meanings inside of our nervous systems, these are called our neurosemantic environment. Neuro, other pertaining to the nerves, semantics of or pertaining to meaning. So the important thing for you and for me is to recognize our neurosemantic environment, the meanings that we have inside of our nervous systems, which are productive or not productive. They lead toward agreement or disagreement, good communication or bad communication, listening or not listening. We control our own destiny according to the assumptions we live by. What assumptions do you have inside of your nervous system? When you go to listen to a speaker, do you say, well, that's a bunch of... I've heard that before. 
We cut people off. We don't really get on their channel of communication. We don't observe the world of reality because of certain attitudes or assumptions inside of our skins. And we all carry around inside of our skins this neurosemantic environment. So the question is, is your neurosemantic environment producing good effects, results for you, or bad effects? The bad effects, of course, the worst effects, these are the ones that end up in mental institutions. The good neurosemantic environment, these are the individuals who are usually productive. These are the ones who are living up to their fullest potential. And this is why I have said constantly that the most important kind of communicating that you and I do is not the kind of communicating that we do with other people, but the kind of communicating that you and I do to ourselves about ourselves. And some people you can never get to. They are the ones who need the training the most. The ones, again, who are afflicted with allness, the closed mind, the refusal to listen, the refusal to learn, the refusal to change or keep up to date. This is part of their neurosemantic environment, the meanings inside of their nervous system. All right, so our semantic environment, language, movies, radio, television, parents, family, religion, culture, this all makes an impingement on our nervous system, and these are the assumptions we live by, the pictures inside of our heads or the meanings inside of our nervous system. All right, what is the first basic misevaluation? And I have put this at the beginning of my seminar. In fact, Dr. Lee at Northwestern University had this at the end. And I remember we had about a three-hour discussion on this, and he agreed that this should be at the beginning. And this is training people in terms of having a symbol reaction. Now, most of us, and this is what we mean by an Aristotelian way of thinking, most of us behave in an automatic trigger-like manner. Stimulus, response the conditioned responses of Pavlov's dogs. Only man can truly respond in terms of a symbol reaction, where he will pause, where he will delay, where he will analyze, where he will literally utilize the cortex. And when you and I respond to our semantic environment around us in an automatic trigger-like manner, we are literally neurologically copying animals in their neurological responses. We are literally copying animals in our neurological responses. And this is why Korzybski had a little bit of humor in him. He said, this is why some human beings behave like animals. They become categorists and dogmatists. And to me, this is tremendously important. Are you and I going to behave in a human kind of a way? And you know just as well as I do that we're, this world needs human kind of responses today more than it ever has in the past. With all the fights, the arguments, the disagreements, the riots, we find more animalistic behavior today than we ever have in the past. And it's not easy to train people, not at all. This is a very, very difficult task. Those of you who are teachers, those of you who are in training, training sessions, because you and I have created our own world of sanity out of this world of complexity and change. We are not open to change. We are resistant to change. And this is why to ask people to change their neurosemantic environment, to change their ways of thinking, communicating, and behaving. This is not easy to do, but it is so tremendously important. And this is why a teacher's job from the kindergarten level up, and even more important than the teacher's job, the parent's job, this is why it is so tremendously important. It is paramount, because I still feel, of course, that the parent is the most important teacher in our society. So number one, if we're going to have an extensional factual orientation, we must manifest a symbol reaction. 
we must pause, delay, and analyze. The first misevaluation under an intentional orientation is this automatic trigger-like reaction. The second barrier to effective communication, or the second characteristic of an intentional orientation, is jumping to conclusions. Or as you see here, passing off inferences as if they were statements of fact. The extensionally, factually oriented person is able to separate his inferences from statements of fact. He knows the difference. He doesn't jump to conclusions. Now, I'm not saying that he doesn't make inferences or assumptions. Your life, my life, our lives are lived on the inferential level. But wisdom begins when you know the difference between the two. Make all the inferences you want, but check your inferences. Don't act on inferences as if they were statements of fact. Now, notice how this first barrier to effective communication, the signal reaction, leads into jumping to conclusions. And if you and I can learn to pause, to delay, to analyze a little longer than we normally do, we will not tend to jump to conclusions. The third barrier to effective communication, the third characteristic of the intentional orientation, is the allness orientation. The assumption that we know it all. And again, the important thing is that this allness orientation is so tremendously subtle. It keeps us from listening, from observing, from looking again, from changing our ways of thinking or communicating, from asking questions. The allness orientation, this is the person who is not conscious of abstracting. And there are two characteristics, two things that you and I must do if we want to lessen or eliminate allness. Number one, we must become conscious of abstracting conscious of the fact that we have or are selecting some characteristics and eliminating others. The guy, the woman who is afflicted with allness, they assume that they know it all. They wrongly assume that they have abstracted everything. They fall victim to the Jehovah complex. And this is why you and I, in being conscious of abstracting, realizing that we cannot abstract everything because of the limitations of time, nervous system, X number of limitations with our acquaintance with things. The second characteristic of realizing the limitations of our knowledge is being conscious of the etc. This is the other device to lessen or eliminate allness. And this is one of the working devices. This is one of the extensional devices that Korzybski devised to become factually oriented. ETC. If we are conscious of the etc., we will not assume that we know it all. All right, then we get into another barrier to effective communication or an intentional orientation, and this is the assumption that meanings are in words. And if you and I wrongly assume that meanings are in words, we will project our meaning into someone else's words and assume that they mean what we would mean if we were doing the talking. Now again, how many of you are taught in high school that words have meaning? Most of you? Okay, now this is the assumption in, in more limited semantics. As we have said, general semantics starts with the assumption that meanings are in people. Don't stop or short circuit the process of communication too soon. Before you disagree, before you argue, before you fight, before you go off and misinterpret what the speaker says, ask one question. What do you mean? Am I right in assuming that you mean such and such? But before you ask questions, you have to manifest a non-allness orientation. Because the allness oriented person, he doesn't ask questions. He knows what you mean. And this is the subtle allness orientation that we've been talking about. So all of these misevaluations and proper evaluations can be listed in terms of the intentional orientation or the extensional orientation. So you must remember that words don't mean people mean. You must become conscious of the ambiguity of language, that words mean many, many different things. But the intentionally oriented person, he has what we call a one-valued orientation toward language. 
He thinks that a word has only one meaning. Whose meaning? His meaning. Now notice I've used the terminology a one-valued orientation. And in another place I will point out how this one-valued orientation is a misevaluation. It is also characteristic of an intentional orientation. Korzybski talked about the fact that most of our important words are what he called multi-ordinal. He talked about the multi-ordinality of the most important terms. This merely means that terms mean different things on different orders of abstractions. As you use them differently in different contexts, they will obviously mean different things, and especially to different people. Words such as peace, coexistence, love. In fact, I have one case, uh, husband and wife were getting a divorce up in uh, Michigan, and uh, the judge uh, asked him, he said, don't you love your wife? Your wife claims you don't love her. And he said, sure, he said, sure I love her. I take out the garbage every week. <laughs> this is his definition of love. And many of the reasons why we have problems on the family or personal level, all the way up to the international level, is because on the international level, the Russians have a completely different meaning for the words peace or coexistence. And the men in our State Department, they had better become conscious of the multi-ordinality of the most important terms. This is why I say we need an anthropologist, hyphen linguist, in the United Nations. Because especially on the international level, meanings are not in words, they are in people conditioned by their particular culture. All right, we have talked about a static orientation. And what we're trying to do in general semantics is to make us have an orientation that fits the structure of the world of reality. Up here in the submicroscopic level, we have said that this is the process level. By process, we mean change. And the important thing in our culture, too many of us have static, non-changing orientations in a changing world. Why do we have static, non-changing orientations in a changing world? One of the reasons why is because our language does not imply the changes to be found in the world of reality. Take your name, John Jones. Is there anything in that name that implies the differences to be found in the person? And if you don't think you're changing, take a look at a picture of yourself 20 or 30 years ago. And so Korzybski said, what we must do is date our evaluations. In other words, you must date yourself, date events, date other people. John Jones, 1963, is not John Jones, 1971. In other words, recognizing that our language has static, non-changing implications... If you're going to make an intentionally oriented structure of language fit the structure of the world of reality, you must use dates to make it extensionally oriented. And I think you will all agree that most words imply a static, non-changing world. So I think this is one of the a genius of an idea in literally changing the structure of the language that we use from an intentional structure to an extensional structure by the use of a date. As Einstein has said, you cannot talk sense until or unless you include the fourth dimension of time. For example, if I ask you how many dimensions you need to find the center of that, you would say one. How many dimensions do I need to find the center of that? You need the width and the height. Here we have a cube. How many dimensions do you need to find the center of that? You need three dimensions. These are the three spatial dimensions. But how many dimensions do you need to find a happening? And obviously you need all four dimensions. The three spatial dimensions and the fourth dimension of time. So Einstein said that if you and I are going to be precise in our thinking, behaving, communicating, 
we must say when. If we want precision in our talking, we must date our evaluations, we must say when. Now the important thing, if we're going to lessen hate, prejudice, disagreement, envy, that we carry around inside of our nervous systems for 10, 20, 30 years. It's important that we date our evaluations. You've got to date your mother, your father, your husband, your sister, your friends. They are not the same today as they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. But even more important than dating other people, you and I must learn how to date ourselves. Too many of us have a static, non-changing orientation about ourselves. Too many people have inferiority complexes. They lack self-confidence because they have the same neurosemantic environment as they did when they were 10 or 12 years old. Too many people think, behave, respond toward other people in exactly the same way that they did when they were young. And this is the failure to date themselves. And I think that this is one of the most important principles that you and I can apply. The failure to date is what we mean again by the intentional orientation. When you do date your evaluations, then you are becoming extensionally or factually oriented. Notice we can put a whole long list of intentional orientations and extensional orientations. And when we behave in terms of the some 15 or 20 extensional principles altogether, this is what we me mean by behaving in a scientific, factual, mature way. Another one of the misevaluations or intentional orientations, Korzybski said, was identification. Now, I have given you what is the vertical identification where we identify, we react to words as if they were the nonverbal things. When we jump to conclusions, we are passing off our inferences as if they were factual. We are identifying different orders of abstraction. This is a vertical identification. But we can also have what we call a horizontal identification. This is identifying two different people, situations, and things in time. Let's say that two years ago or five years ago you had an unfortunate experience with a dentist or a doctor. And it is so easy for you to carry over from last year, five years ago, the same old ways of evaluating neurologically now toward a completely different doctor, a completely different dentist. This is called identification. And this is why Korzybski said, God can forgive your sins, but your nervous system won't. And unfortunately, we carry around inside of us too many of these negative attitudes, an unfortunate aspect of our neurosemantic environment. And this is what we mean by identification, where we identify two things that happen to look alike or they may have the same name, doctor, teacher, dentist, etc. Technically, what we mean by the word identification in this respect is when we see similarities only. We identify when we see similarities only. And as you well know, a characteristic of the structure of the world of reality is that of differences. But you and I must see both similarities and differences. Too often our language and our language structure imply similarities only. But how can we be trained in the seeing of differences? We don't have to worry very much about the seeing of similarities only. Because too often in our intentional orientations, we react to people, situations, and things in an automatic trigger-like manner. And if we had more studies and more tests, you would see how in our culture, most of us react in terms of similarities only. We are deficient in the seeing of differences. The good doctor, the good psychiatrist, the good physicist, the wise man, the mature person, he sees differences where other people see similarities only. 
And this is why it takes time to get down to facts. It takes time to be trained in being a wise person. And by wise, I mean, one definition is the ability to see differences. That's the difference between an intern and an experienced medical doctor. The intern will try to identify people in the world of reality out of his textbook. But the wise doctor, and I could quote the meningers, I can quote many, many doctors, and I have them in my files, to show how they were able to discern, to see differences that the neophyte missed. Well, this is what we mean by the scientific method. And you and I, as, quotes non-scientists, can learn exactly the same scientific method. If you, Leo, try to train all of your workers or act toward your workers as if they're all the same, there's something wrong with your ways of evaluating, right? And the good supervisor, the good executive, the good teacher will index his evaluations, and here is the third extensional device. He will index. The good executive will realize that worker one is not worker two. The good mother will realize that child one is not child two. Differences are so tremendously important in the world of reality. And there was something wrong with Thorstein Veblen's evaluations when he was a professor at the University of Wisconsin. He didn't enjoy teaching that much. He wanted to do more research. He didn't like giving exams. He didn't like testing and, and giving grades. He gave all of his students C's. This is the kind of thinking we do when we don't do any thinking. There are important differences in the world of reality. And it takes time, it takes a certain intellect, it takes a certain gray matter to become factually, non-verbally, extensionally oriented to observe the differences to be found in the world of reality. Our language creates similarities. Our minds create similarities. But there are only differences to be found in the world of reality, and they are tremendous importance. Then, one final kind of a misevaluation that leads into an intentional orientation is a one-valued orientation. And as I have said, I haven't gotten into these in the advanced classes yet, but I will. Now, the one-valued orientation is more extreme than the two-valued orientation. The one-valued orientation very often can be spotted with the words all, every, never, all such and such are such and such, all redheads have temper, all women are no good, all men are no good. Some men and women have these kinds of evaluations. Well, there's something wrong with our ways of thinking when we have one evaluation toward thousands and thousands of unique and individual people. This is the easy way to go through life. This is the simple way to solve problems. And you usually don't solve problems, of course. You only create more problems. That's the one valued orientation. Another kind of an intentional orientation not quite as extreme as the one-valued orientation, is the two-valued orientation. And this is where we only allow two values to X number of people, situations, and things. This is the two-valued orientation, where again, people aren't, they're not all crazy, they're not all bad, they're good or bad. Well, that's not enough either because there are degrees of goodness and badness. And again, we must substitute mathematics as the most perfect language. Another characteristic of the structure of the world of reality, and this is what we are trying to do in general semantics. We're trying to make our ways of thinking, communicating, and behaving fit the structure of the world of reality. All right, what do, what do we know about the structure of the world of reality? Number one, the structure of the world of reality is tremendously complex. Therefore, the non-allness orientation fits the complexity of the world of reality. We also know that a characteristic of the structure of the world of reality 
is change, process. Therefore, we must date our evaluations. We also know that a characteristic of the structure of the world of reality are differences, non-identity. Therefore, we must index our statements, our evaluations continually. We, are, we now, for the fourth characteristic, we realize that a characteristic of the structure of the world of reality are degrees or graded variations. And so we must not classify people, situations, and things in either one extreme or the other. But we must think in terms of degrees or graded variations. And boy, is this ever important today. Because the two-valued orientation leads into this polarity of thinking, leads into disagreement rather than agreement. And we find this among different families, among different individuals, among different groups, racial groups, Democrat, Republican. See, a characteristic of the structure of the world of reality very often, created by man, is a two-valued structure of things. We have Democrats, Republicans, black, white, etc., etc., without looking to see what they have in common or similarities. And what we must therefore do if we're going to eliminate the one-valued orientation or the two-valued orientation is to apply a multi-valued orientation. A many-valued orientation. And how do you do that? You do that by applying the extensional devices. First of all, by having a non-allness orientation. Whenever you and I respond to unique individual people, we don't respond to them with a closed mind, but with an open mind so that we can see the unique individual differences and characteristics that they have. So we also apply the dating. We re-evaluate our evaluations. We index our evaluations so we see them differently. Even the same person is different every day, every minute. You are different every day and every minute. So you and I must use the etc. toward ourselves, date ourselves, index ourselves, and even go one further. You must chain index yourself. By chain indexing, we really mean ecological thinking. Because you in one environment are not the same as yourself in another environment. By chain indexing, we just add another index. And this is why I've been saying that we've had ecological thinking for an awful long time and is very, very important. So the multi or many valued orientation is what we mean by the scientific way of behaving. I think you will agree that most of us in our culture either have a one valued or certainly a two valued orientation. Am I right? And we literally need to be trained in having a multi-valued orientation. Every time I meet you, I should have a different evaluation. I should re-evaluate you in terms of you today. And I could give you so many examples and case histories of people who have static, non-changing orientations. They didn't like their mother-in-law 30 years ago. She may have changed tremendously. Or a mother-in-law dislikes her daughter-in-law. And she may have changed tremendously. But what doesn't change? The mental attitude. The world of reality changes. But sometimes words don't change. Meanings don't change because words have approximately the same meaning that Aristotle gave to them 2,000 years ago. But the important thing to remember is that attitudes unfortunately do not change and they should change. So all of the misevaluations that I've been talking about are what we call the intentional orientation. All of the proper evaluations that I've been talking about lead into an extensional or factual orientation. And I think that you will agree that this is far removed, a great extension over the more limited aspect or definition of the scientific method. This is why Korzybski was entirely right and legitimate in using a new word, intentional orientation and extensional orientation, to describe or apply toward 
a totally new concept in terms of human behavior. Korzybski entitled his book, Science and Sanity, The Scientific Method as the Sane Way of Behaving. As Wendell Johnson has said in his book, People in Quandaries, he said, science as sanity, the scientific method as the sane way of behaving, not in the limited area of our scientific laboratories, but in terms of everything that we do. And Alfred Korzybski said there is a scientific method that can be applied on the kindergarten level, on the high school level, and many teachers are doing so today, and especially in the parental level, because all you need is one island of sanity in the family, and usually it is the mother. We need more islands of sanity, not only in the family, but throughout the world, and that's why I hope all of you will continue on to carry on the work that we have started here. Only when we as individuals, families, groups, companies, and nations have learned to apply, and notice I emphasize the word apply, because only then are we truly becoming extensional. We talk about manifesting the principles of general semantics of manifesting the principles of extensional behavior in contradistinction to only professing them. Only when we have learned to apply the methods of science, the factual or extensional orientation in all of our interrelationships will we be able to live in harmony with good communication and with peace among all men. It is not an easy task because of the many more misevaluations that I have not even begun to refer to. And you go into anthropology, psychiatry, sociology, and you will see how complex all of the human problems really are. All that we can hope is that we apply some of these principles more than we now do. We can lessen or eliminate some of the problems, arguments, conflicts, disagreements, hate, prejudice, jealousy, and ultimately wars that have been so much a part of human nature. Thank you all very much.